Hi, and welcome to Far From Home with me, Mabel Nainan, your host. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Bronwyn, who is another fellow Redbud writer. Bronwyn Leah wears many different hats. She's a pastor of discipleship in her local church in Northern California. She's a mom to three hilarious tweens, teens, <laughs> a wife to a fellow Af South African, Jeremy, an editor and leadership coach with Propel Women. She's the author of Beyond Awkward Side Hugs, a practical and accessible guide to cultivating healthier community between Christian men and women. A former lawyer and seminary graduate, she cares about justice, truth, wisdom, quality relationships within the church, and emotionally healthy spirituality. So she teaches rights, and pastors to equip others in these areas. And it's such an honor and privilege to have Bronwyn Lear on uh, our podcast. So welcome, Bronwyn. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited <laughs> to meet your audience. Did I say your last name right, Leah? You you said it the way many people do say it, but it's actually rhymes with a cup of tea. Just Lee. Oh, just Lee. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bronwyn Lee. So sorry about that. Okay. I should have checked. <laughs> with you. So Bronwyn, let me ask you this, this question that we ask most of our guests who are immigrants or refugees, what's your favorite childhood memory? And I know that you were born and raised in South Africa. So tell us which city you were born in and what's your favorite memory? I was born in the very north of South Africa, very close to the Zimbabwean border, it was then Rhodesia, in a little town called Palabora, right next to the Kruger National Park, if anybody has ever heard anything about that. But we left there very early, so I have no memories from being exactly there. But where I do have memories from is that we used to travel to Cape Town every year, which is where my mom was from and where her parents live. And I have just a, a ton of wonderful childhood memories with my grandfather who had been in a railway accident when he was about 20 or 21 and had fallen under a train, you know, horseplay on the train station. And he had lost like seven of his toes and had had to learn how to walk again. And but he was just such a wonderful man with wisdom and humility. And uh, he used to like wear sandals. And I remember him um, teasing us about how ridiculous our toes looked because look at you you have like 10 of them he would say that's so unnecessary and he would point to these three toes of his and say and see these wonderful wonderful specimens of art they're all that you need and he had just a way of flipping the script in how he had dealt with this loss of many years before which remains very precious to me thank you for sharing that personal memory Tell us about your journey to the U.S., what brought you to the U.S., and if you could also share how you felt in the first few weeks that you were in the U.S. If you remember, I know it was a long time ago, but the culture <laughs> shocks or anything that stood out to you as strange or weird. Sure. I never thought I would land up in the United States. That was not something I saw on the cards. I had just graduated from seminary and was beginning a career in ministry, which I was excited about, and which felt called to. And in the first three weeks of my brand new job as a seminary graduate, I met this guy. And within a year, we had married. And within six weeks of our being married, he said, you know, I think I actually do want to do my PhD. And he had done a master's here in the States beforehand and had contacts. And so this guy that I had just married phoned up someone on the other side of the world and said, I actually do want to do the PhD. And he said, great, send us your transcripts and we'll have you in the full program. And I was like, wait, what, what just happened? Who was this person I just married? And so uh, within the first couple of months of marriage, I came along as the plus one of a graduate student. And we thought we would be here for three years while he did his PhD, but life had lots of other plans and I remember feeling a lot like I just wasn't sure what this was going to mean I had just I'd finished two sets of graduate school and now I couldn't work and mm -hmm. there was nothing for me to do I had had a huge relationship network of friends and family where we were left and there was nobody and I had just started a ministry and job that I felt called to and uniquely carved out for and I gave it up 
and mm. was sitting around in the public library because it had internet just trying to find meaningful ways to pass the time. So I was bored and I was lonely. And at the time I was bracing myself for, uh, okay, well, this will be a couple of years and I'll find something to do in the meantime. But I remember my husband who had been here as a graduate student before saying to me, welcome to the tribe of nomads, he said, because once you've lived overseas, you never quite fully go home in the same way again. So whether we're here for one year or whether we're here for many years, I'm there's something about living overseas that makes you look at your home country differently. And I remember sitting in the library thinking, I wonder what that means. Did you, both of you think that this would just be a temporary thing or yeah. you, you knew that you, or you thought that you would be going back home after he finishes his we, we fully intended to go back um, after he finished his PhD. That was what we had expected. And that was what we thought was possible mm -hmm. um, as well as desirable. But the PhD took a little longer than we expected for various reasons. And by the time he was finishing, we were about to have our second child. Mm. And that was in 2009. And the economy crashed. And every single job, literally in the whole world, in academia, got pulled within the space of a couple of weeks. And we were sitting with 1.9 children and 30s. <laughs> Uh, with an unemployable husband and nowhere to go. And so we were like, well, what do we do now? Because if we went back to South Africa at that point, it, he would have been starting as if he hadn't had the PhD. So we were like, well, what does that mean? And at mm -hmm. that point, his advisor here created a postdoc for him, trusted him, made that position possible. And so we stayed because it was literally the only job in the world. Mm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I was a about to give birth <laughs> so I was really not in a position to make big and strategic choices so we were very very grateful for community employment it was a lifeline and we took it when you said earlier that you couldn't work for viewers or listeners for their benefit am I right to assume that that was because of your visa situation Yes, uh, you can only do what a visa allows you to do. Mm -hmm. And I was my husband's plus one in this country. And so when he had first come over as a graduate student, the visa class that he was in allowed me to apply for work authorization. But he changed visa statuses within three or four years. And on that visa status, I could not apply for anything. And so there was a period from when I was 30 until I was almost 40, no, until after I turned 40, when he was in a visa category where I was legally allowed to remain as his dependent, but I couldn't even like sell stuff at a garage sale, sale mm. technically, like to be self-employed. Mm. And so there was just this long period of vulnerability yeah, that, yeah. that I was in where I was legally here but I was utterly vulnerable if my husband was to die or to lose his job. And I particularly worried that if he was to die, I would have to leave the country and I had little children and I would not even be allowed to stay to take care of them under that. And there was no category because you have to, for a visa, you know, be eligible for whatever category that visa is in. And there was no category that I was eligible to apply for. And people didn't really know and understand that. Mm -hmm. But it was a long period of being pretty vulnerable in that process and feeling yeah. like people's helpful remarks were less than helpful. And I didn't want to have to explain the technicalities to everybody who was asking, but there were some scary years, both in my marriage and just in my parenting. I thought a lot about what uh, the Bible says in First Peter 3 about how Sarah submitted to her husband and did not give way to fear because mm -hmm. I felt like I was submitting to his calling, but I needed to trust and not give way to fear in that situation. Yeah, yeah. And we didn't speak about this earlier, but I just wanted to throw it out there about how this affects our marriages, right? So for me, and I talk about this a little bit in, a, in, in the book that I wrote, Far From Home, that initially I had developed some kind of bitterness towards my husband, you know, like a little bit of resentment because his career flourished while mine didn't. Mine like came to a standstill. And, and so there was this time in our marriage where, you know, I, I felt resentful towards him. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know if it was the same for you or something different, but how did it affect your relationship with your husband? Oh, that's a really, really good question. Um, I mean, this was a period of well over 10 years. Mm -hmm. I would say that the most endearing feeling that I had was a feeling of frustration that I wanted him to work on getting applying for residency on a green card more urgently and he felt like he wasn't ready to do it and he had time but I don't think he really ever understood what emotion was driving that for me it wasn't just that I thought it was reasonable or a good idea or that I thought we could succeed in it it was that I was vulnerable until that loop was closed and so I was frustrated for a number of years that I felt like he was dilly-dallying about something that was scary to me and i didn't feel like he saw how scary that was. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I totally understand that. And again, for those who are listening who may not know about, you know, visa categories or the paperwork and the legal hoops that we have to jump through, what Bronwyn is talking about is that when you come on a work visa and there's so many different categories of work visa and you bring a dependent along, your visa is tied to your uh, employer. And so if you lose that job, you'd have to go back to your passport country, as you call it. So, And in many visa categories, it works that way. And so even if you have dependents or if you have children and you lose that job, which means you don't have a legal reason to stay in the country uh, in certain visa categories. And it was the same with us for many years. So you'll have to just pack up and go. So there's always this fear, like what happens if for some reason you know, our spouses lose our job. And so I, I understand that. And you wrote about it. Tell us about the article that you wrote in uh, HuffPost. This was a few years ago. This was a few years ago. Yeah. So I, for those years that I was at home and could not work legally, I, and I had been in vocational ministry. So I started writing because that was a place that I could serve. But at one point I realized that there was this conversation that well-meaning Christian people kept on having about immigration around me without realizing that I was an immigrant. So, you know, because you didn't look, you know, you didn't because fit I'm the white box, and right? I think because I'm white yeah. and English speaking, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So there's all this conversation that people were having about the borders and about dreamers and whether there should be a path to citizenship. So this was a hot conversation through the Obama administration. And then it escalated in a very different way from 2016 onwards. But that conversation was hot in in Christian circles with people talking about what, you know, what our attitude to foreigners should be. And I would often be in the room and then I would hear people talking as if I wasn't a foreigner. Mm. And so at some point I wrote a piece to say, I, I am an immigrant. And there are some things that you need to understand. Like when you talk about immigration, you make it sound like if people just, you know, were honest, paid the fees, and did their due diligence that, of course, they could be here. And you don't understand how hard it is to be here. Mm. I am educated, you know, English speaking. I have American born children. We're here legally. And there is no path for me. Immigration is not like riding, a, you know, standing in the line for a ride to Disneyland. And if you just stand in line long enough, eventually you'll get to go. There is no line mm. for a bunch of people, not even for me. And that was shocking to a bunch of people. They really didn't realize how difficult it was to immigrate. And mm -hmm. because they didn't realize how difficult it was, their frustration at, at uh, people of, why can't you just do this legally, was mitigated when they realized, oh, there are a bunch of people, including our friend who's in Bible study with us, who couldn't do this legally if she tried. But I wanted to kind of, kind of try and educate people so that they could have one, a little bit more understanding about their own system, because why would they know about the U.S. immigration process unless they'd had to engage with it this way? So there was an education piece to it. But then mm -hmm. there was also an empathy piece that I kind of wanted to write about at the time, because the other people who know about immigration are the people who are being punished and struggling and they can't afford to speak out about it because it's dangerous for them what's dangerous for their loved ones. Whereas I had experience of the system, but because I was here legally and I had a platform, I could shed light on it. And I felt like that was something that I kind of needed to do because who else would they hear it from? Mm, yeah. And I wonder if, you know, 
people assuming that you're not an immigrant also has to do with your skin color and how you can easily blend in with American society because you look, I mean, if someone looking at you would just probably assume you're American uh, because you're white. So how does that play into this conversation and what are your thoughts about that? I think that our experience with multiple, it was just really well-meaning, lovely believers, but their reaction to us showed us that so often the race, the immigration question is actually a race question. You know, people's response to me was, oh, I can't believe that, you know, they wouldn't let you in. Oh, that's that feels wrong. Like it, people responded as if it was an injustice that there wasn't a category for me. And then we would say, well, why don't you feel like it's an, an injustice for people coming from a different country or people who don't look like me? Mm-hmm. And so our experience provided a bit of a mirror for the fact that this conversation wasn't just about being English speaking or about sort of paperwork or administrative duties, often there's an unexamined bias and an implicit bias that our story illuminated. And it illuminated it for us as well. I think my experience as an immigrant made me realize how much white privilege I had, which in a way that even growing up in apartheid South Africa didn't make me realize. I realized that I get given the benefit of a doubt in the way that my women of color writer friends who were American born get questioned about their background and they sound American. I don't even (laughs) sound like I'm from here, but people aren't always asking me where I'm from. So yeah, it, those things run very close together. And, and I think it's important to, to pause it. Yeah. Yeah. And you make, and you make a good point in many ways, xenophobia is related to racism. It's not just that the fear of a stranger, we don't know what his culture is or, who he is and it's it's a fear of the unknown but it's also if the the stranger is someone from uh, a different racial background Mm -hmm. we tend to be more suspicious of them yeah and it's a good thing to be aware of it Mm -hmm. so thank you for speaking up about that another question I had for you is about you know the visits back home do you get to visit um, South Africa well, we had to for a bunch of years because you can only be here for as long as your visa paperwork lasts. And then for us, we had to go back to our passport country every time to have that renewed. So we uh, got to go home <laughs> <laughs> sort of every 18 months or so because it was required. Um, mm-hmm. So all of our leave and any savings we had basically was all spent for a good 15 years in mm-hmm. just maintaining our documentation. Mm, yeah. How do you feel like going back and then coming back here? Do you ever experience, because I do, I experience reverse culture shocks. Yes. Because now I've adjusted to life here and then I go back and the life that I once knew kind of seems strange to me. And sometimes I find it weird that in my own passport country or in India sometimes that I don't feel like I belong or I don't understand the conversations because it's been so long. Mm-hmm. that I've lived there and been part of the culture. Do you feel, what are your thoughts on just hopping between cultures? <laughs> well, this is where my husband's advice that very first week we landed has come out to play again and again. And when he said, welcome to the tribe of nomads, he was right. Yeah. You never land up fully belonging anywhere. Like we will, we are now, as of a couple of months ago, US citizens. It took that long. <laughs> mm-hmm. It took that long. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Mm-hmm. It's a relief to have a, a stronger passport, mm. which uh, makes a big difference, particularly as our parents are aging and we sometimes need to be more available than we were before. Mm. It was a good 10 years where if something had happened to one of our parents because of our visa status and our passports, we couldn't just get on a plane and go home. So that's a different vulnerability. Mm. So I appreciate being able to do that now. But even with a US passport, I'm still never going to be fully American. You know, I still can't tell the difference between, you know, when people say the name of a sports team, I have to ask every time, is that a baseball team? Like, (laughs) I don't don't know. I'm sorry. I feel like I should know. Like, I wasn't raised on Sesame Street. I'm never going to be fully here. But I also haven't been in South Africa for almost 20 years. And so my belonging there kind of got frozen in time. 
Mm. So I have a historic connection to the place. But these days, you know, people say to me, well, you know, as a South African, what do you think about what's happening here and there and there? And I say, I don't know. I actually haven't lived there for a very, very long time. Mm. and I don't get the news and that my kids are not being educated in that school and this is not the church context that I'm in anymore so I I don't have current ties I'm not part of making the culture in the country and my church community there part of what it is and so yeah it's this it's a chapter right Mm. instead of a continuing story yeah yeah and tell us how your faith grew as a result of you becoming an immigrant and you mentioned the first few years of living in in a sense of you know a vulnerability and a fear of the mm-hmm. unknown or what could happen what might happen not being able to work and you said you felt lonely you felt bored how did that affect your your relationship with god and how did you cope with it or Okay, so I'm asking too many questions, but I just wanted to know how okay, did you them. walk with God? How did you cope with it? And you know what do you see as a blessing coming out of that? Mm-hmm. I did not realize until I was a person without a country to claim and without a country that was claiming me how much of the scripture is written to people who are in an in, 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 in between place. Mm-hmm. You know, the father of faith, Abraham, was promised a country, left his home went to live in this place, in a place God had promised him, which he never until the day he died actually got to call his own. And and we are his children of faith. And there is so much in the scripture that talks about how, what it means to be people of faith who long for a better country, like Hebrews 11 talks about. And that language that there is in the New Testament about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven being and being citizens of that kingdom Mm -hmm. became precious to me, not just in an abstract biblical theological, oh, yes, I also will be welcomed (laughs) by the king of glory one day kind of way, but in a personal place that there is a king who claims me as his Mm -hmm. citizen. That is my first identity. And no matter what passport I carry, that's the place that I'm ultimately going. And it became very, very precious to me at an identity level, not just a Mm. functional level. Mm. Because we do often self-describe by country. Mm. You know, people are Americans, people are South Africans. And I, in that time where that was a pain point and there was uncertainty, and I couldn't even identify by career because that was on pause. I couldn't say, oh, I'm a South African lawyer or, oh, you know, <laughs> I'm a whatever. I was a daughter of the king of God's kingdom, mm. yeah. which is the greatest honor of the greatest kingdom. Mm. But it was funny how often that didn't feel like yeah. enough. Mm-hmm. So my faith was formed by that. And even now as a citizen holder, like a part, uh, as a passport holder now, I'm grateful for the benefit that concedes, but I would never, ever trade what God did to foment my primary sense of belonging in that decade of uncertainty. Wow. So beautiful and so meaningful. Tell us about your book that you wrote, Awkward (laughs) Side Hugs, right? That's the title. Yeah, because yesterday I was just, I thought of your book yesterday. I mean, you were on my mind because I knew I was going to interview you. And we had a friend come and stay with us. I mean, believe it or not, he drove all the way to watch a cricket match with us. I'm sure, you know cricket, right? Even though, you're... Uh, of course, of course, <laughs> South Africa is doing pretty badly today. I was texting <laughs> with an Indian friend about it this morning. <laughs> yeah, and so when the time came to say bye and all that, there were a lot of awkward side hugs, and I thought, ha, huh, you know, I, I thought of the name of your book, Beyond Awkward Side Hugs, makes so much sense. So talk about your book, why you wrote it. <laughs> Oh my goodness, yes. Well, one of the things that I discovered moving to the States from overseas is that the American church is kind of weird about the topic about men and women in a way that I just didn't understand. I did not understand (laughs) what the rules were socially, why people were afraid of certain things that I just wasn't afraid of, and why I was afraid of some things that other people weren't afraid. I was like, oh my goodness, where you are raised really shapes the things you love and the things you fear and I realized that one of the things that 
the American church is very shaped by is the story that men and women are always either, you know, falling in love and riding into the sunset. That's the beautiful story. Or we're afraid that everything is going to go wrong. And it's the horror story. Mm. And that's kind of the story of the culture, right? Like it's either love or it's disaster, but it's kind of also the story of the church. And I thought, no wonder men and women are so awkward around each other. They don't know how to be friends. They don't know how to live as the family of God. And the Bible has so much to say about what it means to live as a community who are the family of God. No erotic love whatsoever in the Bible's language of how we are to love one another. It is agape and conditional love. It is familial love. It is friendship love. There's this like multiplicity of loves that are supposed to knit us together in intimacy. And then we get to the church and everyone's like, nope, all the boys on the right, all the girls (laughs) on the left or else danger happens. And I was thinking, I think we're missing something. Yeah. So I wanted to write into that because I think that the scriptures have a better story to tell about community and a better story to tell about who we are as men and women than the story that our culture writes, or even that our church culture has written. My primary relationship to you is not as a competitor for a man's attention. And it is not even as, you know, a fellow writer, my relationship to you primarily is one as a sister in Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are spiritual siblings first. That's right. Mm -hmm. And any other relationships that we have are derivative of that and built on that. Mm -hmm. What does that look like in the church? So I kind of wanted to explore that in a way that was both biblically true, but also practically helpful. Like, what does that mean for dating? What does that mean for friendship? Can I, can I be friends with a married man? in a way that's healthy? What does that mean for church? What does that mean for dating? What does that mean for me and my husband in the way that we sort of face the world? And I I hope that it's both practical and and deeply biblical. I hope people can see that there are principles, that I'm not making anything up. I, that family language is embedded in scripture. And I think it's incumbent on us to, to figure out what it means to walk it out in our context. Wow, such an important book. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm going to buy a copy and (laughs) get my hands on it and read it. And also reminded me that the early church did that so well. And the church grew and benefited from such relationships. In every letter of Paul, he talks about these women who were like co-laborers and Mm -hmm. who clearly he had uh, deep friendships with. Mm -hmm. Uh, Right now that you say that, it it's completely biblical and the church can grow and thrive when we realize the value of such intergender relationships mm-hmm. thank you for writing that book uh, and for oh, I'm those excited books. about it I yeah. <laughs> I think it's a beautiful thing you know Jesus said the world world would know we are Christians by the quality of our love for one another and if we're afraid to get close to one another <laughs> we're afraid to talk to one another it's very hard for other people to see us loving so yeah we, we yeah. need to figure out how to do that in a healthy wise like robust way yeah. also people are lonely lonely mm-hmm. so if we don't figure out how to talk to one another then we're feeding loneliness epidemic yeah do you think it's also a product of the american culture being too sexualized oh totally yeah that's the subtitle of the book you know cultivating healthy male female friendships in a sex crazed world yes oh totally (laughs) (laughs) it was so good to talk with you bronwyn is there anything else uh you'd like to say about your immigrant journey anything that you really want to talk about or you think would be helpful to other immigrants Oh, I want to encourage immigrants listening to this. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage you that the world is better for your presence in different spaces. The church is better for your witness about the many and varied ways in which God works. You can see things in your church that other people may not be able to see. And they, because they come from a different place, might be able to see things that you cannot see. So if you're in a space where your ethnic story is different, you add value to the wisdom of your community. And that's a beautiful thing. And in as much as we have different people from different places worshiping together, we are foreshadowing God's ultimate plan of every tribe, tongue, and nation worshiping together. So don't second guess your place. Mm. God has good purposes for his immigrant children peppered all around the world. Wow. I love that. Thank you so much for that word of encouragement. 
It was such a blessing to be able to talk with you. And thank you for sharing your wisdom and your experience with us. It's a great joy. Bless you.